From the Folger Shakespeare Library, this is Shakespeare Unlimited. I'm Barbara Bogave. When you hear the words Shakespearean tragedy, you probably think right away of King Lear, Macbeth, or maybe Hamlet, and a fall from a great height. It's such a common phrase that we all assume we know exactly what it means. But my guest today, Rodri Lewis, has taken a fresh look at the ways in which Shakespeare experimented with classical tragedy to put his own spin on tragic drama, a take that today still resonates as uniquely modern. Rodri Lewis teaches English at Princeton University, and his latest book is called Shakespeare's Tragic Art. Hi, Rodri. Welcome. Hi, Barbara. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. I almost feel like apologizing for for asking you to do this, but since we're talking about how Shakespeare experimented with classic tragedy Mm -hmm. and the tragic form, we have to first make sure we know what the form is. So, in 60 (laughs) seconds or less, please define our term. What is tragedy? Go. Well, actually, it's a really very low bar generically um, in the 16th century. It's really, at this stage, a form of writing which is usually dramatic and concerns people of importance and foremost rank, princes, generals, kings, queens, those sorts of things, and tracks their sort of rise and fall in some way or another. In in Shakespeare's period, in the early modern period, you're saying. Exactly so, exactly so. Okay. I'm, first of all, kudos that you were able to do that, and without mm. using any Greek or Latin. And um, I want to get into the text because it's in the details that you, your argument really shines. Um, sure. But first, I do have, I was really interested in this, in one graph, really, in your introduction, which is about the challenge that Shakespeare took on with his tragedies. And you write that, and this is a quote, to find a way of writing about a world framed and characterized by delusions of one sort or another. And he took on this challenge without surrendering his works to expediency, opportunism, deceit, self-deceit, and despair. Sure. Okay, that's a lot of emotions there. I, I, I mean, tell me more about what you mean here and why Shakespeare in particular faced this challenge. What, what I, um, I suppose I was getting at there is the thing that I think he's preoccupied with in, in these tragedies, or the principal thing he's preoccupied with, is the series of fictions through which we try to explain ourselves and our worlds to ourselves, if that makes sense. The ideologies, the belief systems, um, the stories um, we tell ourselves in the attempt for things to cohere. In a sense, that kind of world is a world of satire, you know, where the satirist, the angry outsider, is poking fun, savage fun very often, at the weaknesses and the corruptions and the blind spots and the barely constrained self-interest of various different actors, all of whom are, you know, hypocrites. Shakespeare doesn't do that. He tries to feel his way inside that world, to think his way inside that world, and to give us a space in his tragedies through which we, in the audience as readers or as playgoers or as both, are able to recognize something um, perhaps unsettling about the human condition, and that hopefully gives us the wherewithal to understand ourselves better and perhaps to conduct ourselves in a more clear-eyed and possibly humane sort of way. Oh, that's interesting. And I wanted to ask that again as a way of giving a context for the conversation because it made me question well, were other playwrights at the time not doing this? You know, Shakespearean tragedy is a is a is a sort of distinctive way of writing. But I don't want to sort of, by the same token, make Shakespeare sound like some sort of isolated, solitary genius. I mean, he was able to lean on the examples um, and some of the ideas of the writers, the English writers, um, stage writers who went before him. And I suppose foremost amongst those are Christopher Marlowe and Thomas Kidd. And Shakespeare learns from the sorts of things they're doing and is and is quite happy to um, adapt them and to really take them over and to transform them into something of, of his own. I mean, he is a sort of, you know, magpie figure. But after he's done his magpie work, he, he takes his shiny things and, and creates something very, very different, I think, and distinctive. 
Okay, great. Now I feel really grounded. Thank you for that. And now we can get our fingers into the plays. So uh, what's really interesting about your book is that you track Shakespeare's experiments and tragedy in the order that he wrote them, uh, or that we think he wrote them, because yeah. we, sh- we have to say we don't exactly yeah, yeah. know the order, the dates. But anyway, let's go with it. Uh, Titus and Jonicus, you call a slasher movie, which I really appreciated. And you <laughs> say that much of what we love in Shakespearean tragedy, we can see in, in Titus in embryonic form. So what new concept of of tragedy is Shakespeare beginning to experiment with here? It's a bloodbath, as you say. It's a bloodbath, yeah. yeah. What's interesting about it and what I think um, makes it, uh, make, justifies that claim about some parts of Shakespearean um, tragedy being there in embryo is the way in which the plot is organized not through not through things that are necessary i mean conventional tragedy in one kind or another the idea is the plot is held together by chains of either necessity or probability such that tragic inevitability and those sorts of things that we perhaps talked about in high school um, or wrote essays about in high school can can come into focus. That's not the case here. It's it's um, a series of accidents and grand passions which don't necessarily have to have happened the way they did, but do because for Shakespeare, I think it's those those sort of connected accidents, unintended consequences that actually animate the events in which we often get caught up and get beyond um, our control. As you say, Shakespeare's experimenting with plot, but he's also working with language. And you point out that in Titus, people speak more Latin than than people do in the other plays. Um, but it makes his characters seem wooden and cartoonish. And you write that he fixes that problem possibly a few years later, we think, in Romeo and Juliet. How does yeah. he do that? Um, well, you know, one of the things that tragic tragic characters are supposed to do um, is to speak in, you know, highfalutin philosophical language. And in, in Titus Andronicus, he tries to do that by, you know, quoting lots of Latin classics. Tragedy is supposed to give rise to fear and pity, but we kind of only really feel fear. Well, I, anyway, only feel fear. And disgust. Um, and disgust, um, rather than that sense of pity. And he takes a few years off after this, comes back with Romeo and Juliet, and I think it's really in the character of Juliet, and it's fascinating that it should be in a, a young woman um, is the vehicle for him, you know, first figuring this out, how to do that, that sort of thing that we think of as being a characteristic of um, Shakespearean tragedy, which is to say the soliloquy in which the character isn't talking to us, like, say, Richard III breaking the fourth wall to tell us you know, what his cunning stratagems are to entrap his rivals. But seeing that character talking to themselves, Juliet in particular, just before she's about to take the sleeping potion, and she's thinking, you know, what if this What if this goes wrong? What if I die? What if I'm stuck in here? How's it all going to go? Anyway, she's right. Oh, if I wake, sort of, shall I not be distraught? Precisely. Uh, um, and considering, you know, waking up being surrounded by the bones of her dead family and Tybalt and, you know, whoever else. Uh, and um, this extraordinary sort of interiority. It And he does it in a way that does not rely on highfalutin, humanistic, classically derived language. And because she's a woman a young woman, I think it gives Shakespeare the freedom to experiment with with a, with a form of dramatic speech, which is not sort of weighed down by classical derivations, as Titus Andronicus does all the time. Juliet, precisely because she's not an aristocrat and precisely because she's a woman, gives him the space in which to uh, um, start doing something very different. So if Romeo and Juliet is Shakespeare experimenting with tragic inevitability and more naturalistic speech, what does his next tragedy, uh, or what we think is his next tragedy, Julius Caesar, tell us about the development of his tragic vision? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's one, of the, one of the puzzles about that play is that it's, it's called Julius Caesar, right? I mean, it's, it's as if Macbeth were called Duncan. Um, because, right, because uh, you know, he goes away the, pretty the, quickly. The, yeah, the title <laughs> character is portrayed as a sort of old soldier living on former glories who's a little bit enfeebled. And so the, the center, um, the center of tragic focus is Brutus. 
And that facility that Shakespeare has developed in himself of writing, and this is something that he's gone on to do post-Juliet, the way in which when we talk to ourselves, we very often deceive ourselves, um, mm. is, is, I think, the real extraordinary achievement of, of Julius Caesar in the sense that when Brutus has been talking to Cassius and Cassius has been trying to recruit him to the conspiracy, Brutus retires to his orchard to, you know, think it all over. But, you know, he desperately wants to do this. But he's also a principal fellow who wants to think of himself as doing the right thing. Right. He's trying to justify his deep sense of honor with this act of betrayal exactly. and assassination of Caesar. And he really, he just, I'm just picturing Patterson Joseph, because he was so wonderful in this role, arguing with himself, just hashing it out. Um, and There's I, a sense in which he's talking himself into something that he's decided to do already. Right, right. If that makes sense. And, and that, that there is, you get I to think, the delusion, the self-delusion. Yeah, that, 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 that wonderful hinge in the in the play has fashioned it thus. You know, okay, he's not actually been a threat. And, you know, you know yes, I do have debts of loyalty. And, yes, you know, he has been an, an impressive um, Roman leader for, for a very long time. But... You know, he may become a tyrant. Um, so, not that we have any evidence that that's actually true from the play, but he may. And that's enough. That's enough. He must die. Mm. Uh, um, and it's an extraordinary, it's not hypocrisy. You know, it's not, he doesn't, he's not acting in bad faith. You know, he's done something. We watched him justifying um, his desires to himself in a way that enables him to behave in the way in which he wants to. And it's a, a truly sort of extraordinary, dramatic, tragic moment where we get to see Brutus, in a sense, becoming self-alienated because, you know, he can't acknowledge himself to himself because his, you know, the principled defender of the Republic um, is the, 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 the image of himself that he must hold on to. And he can't, he can't allow himself to be, to, to acknowledge the part of himself, which is that, you know, he wants to really do it just like Hesius does in order that the, his class can defend their power. Right, and he shatters. Um, yeah, is completely. This, yeah. Is this the beginning of the modern unstable self? Is this why Julius Caesar seems, or Brutus seems so modern? I mean... I'm always a bit wary of, of those sorts of claims. But there's, uh, I mean, in the sense that there's plenty of people who go through cognate moments in, for example, you know, Euripides, which is not very modern. There's <laughs> a very good reason it was written a long time ago. Um, but there's certainly, in my reading, I can't think of anyone else who is doing this sort of thing with this degree of attention and acuity in, well, in any of the modern languages I read anyway. So I'm quite happy to say, certainly, whether this is the fractured modern self, I think that probably we can come back to that. If, if that exists, it has origins a little bit earlier. But this is certainly one of the first times we see the depiction of, of that kind of self on the stage or any space like that. Okay, well, continuing what we think is chronologically, um, <laughs> you turn to Hamlet next, and, and you point out that it's a play about things, but that uh, you analyze the opening scene in a way in which you say that it, it forces the audience to grapple with the appearance of phenomena, of, of things. So elaborate on how this opening does that and how this is a continuation of Shakespeare's transformation of the tragic form. I talked a little bit um, just a second ago about the innovation, or one of the innovations in Julius Caesar, being that Shakespeare was able to uh, talk about how, how this character, in talking to himself, ends up deceiving himself um, about who and what he is, which in turn leads to his uh, destruction. I um, mean, one of the really interesting, um, and perhaps the reason that Hamlet, you know, is probably still the tragedy, or at least the Shakespearean tragedy anyway, is that one of those things we can't explain is us. You know, who and what we are what we're for, what we should be feeling. People talk all the time about Hamlet's dilemma, or, you know, what it is, what is it that stops him revenging? And I think the answer is much, much simpler than people often um, sort of make out. Um, it's that he doesn't actually feel the burning desire for vengeance against his uncle that he expects to feel when the ghost begins telling him, 
telling him his narration of how he was killed. And then Hamlet, immediately after that, we, we have his second soliloquy where he talks about his memory and all the rest of it, saying a lot of the things that a revenger should say precisely because they enable him to, you know, avoid confronting the fact that he is not seized with the burning intensity, the, the vindictive ardor um, that the revenger is supposed to have and that, you know, for example, Laertes has in spades when he finds out that Polonius um, has been killed later in the play. He can't. He, you know, he f finds different ways of talking to himself to, you know, hide from the fact that he can't um, while simultaneously asserting that he can understand um, who he is and what he wants to do. I'm starting to understand something I was going to ask you, which is, and this is a rough paraphrase which, uh, of your words, uh, you write that this isn't tragedy holding the mirror up to nature, but instead Shakespeare's suggesting that the special status of tragedy is that it can reveal to its audiences their tendency to botch the words up to fit their own thoughts. Yes. Yeah, yeah. He loves versions of that of that phrase. I mean, we get them in Julius Caesar, we get them um I mean, well, we get them throughout all the tragedies, in fact, from Julius Caesar all the way through to through to Coriolanus. Um that idea that we 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 don't just uh, misapprehend the way things are, the way we are, but we we misapprehend because of the way we talk to ourselves about the way things are. And tragedy is a way of acknowledging that is the case, but those kinds of fiction needn't actually have tragic or otherwise um, calamitous consequences if we acknowledge them as such, if that makes sense. Hamlet can't do but that. Let me ask you about that, because my next question was how is Shakespeare experimenting with tragic catharsis in Hamlet? Yeah, that's a really good question and a very tricky one to answer. Um, I mean, it's tricky for a variety of reasons. I mean, I suppose foremost amongst which is, you know, historically speaking, catharsis, you know, in this case, the 16th century, give or take, catharsis is not the big deal within tragic theory or practice that we, it, it will become um, in the 18th, 19th centuries and, and beyond. But it's usually thought of as being either a sort of purgation or a purification. You know, we, we have big feelings watching these plays and having those big feelings, you know, leaves us, you know, purged in the same way that, you know, one might take a laxative to, to clear out the humors within ancient medicine and make, make ourselves stop having bad dreams or whatever it might be. So that's a, the sort of principle, the principle idea of catharsis as a kind of emotional purgation. Uh, I love that. Uh, tragedy is the ipecac of, <laughs> <laughs> of literature. Indeed. <laughs> but, um, I think Shakespeare is doing something else. Um, I borrow here from um, the idea of catharsis sketched by the um, Chicago philosopher Martha Nussbaum, who says, actually, what we should really be thinking about is catharsis as a kind of clarification. And, you know, the ancient Greek actually bears that, bears that translation. Uh, it's just not one that had been offered very much before. And uh, it's a particular kind of clarification. We, you know, we are very used to thinking of ourselves, human beings, that is, as kind of rational agents whose intelligence and powers of reason enable them to understand themselves and the um, world around them. And more often than not, it's uh, a power that operates independently of our emotions. What Nussbaum argues, and I think really powerfully and persuasively, in a book called The Fragility of Goodness, is that catharsis, as in, in this Aristotelian sense, is about recognizing that we are innately and inescapably emotional agents, that our emotions are a key part of our knowing process, you know, how we think and understand. So our rationality needs our emotions to process the world around it. Tragedy on, on, this, on this telling is something which enables us to observe ourselves as, you know, emotional people, as emotional agents um, at the same time as we are thinking. And it does so because tragedy, as it plays out before us on the stage, teaches us through our emotions at the same time as our rationality, we are forced because big feelings come up in our in our breasts, as it were, as we as we watch um, Hamlet. We are forced to confront the inherently emotional 
um, natures of our res um, responses to the world. I mean, Shakespeare obviously had not read Martha Nussbaum, and I'm not sure he'd have got on very well with her if he had. But um, <laughs> but but, um, but that that idea, I think, is um, gets at you know the why. Why is he doing this? Why is he bothering writing these you know incredibly complicated explorations of the human condition? when he could frankly be making more money with comedies and histories. Okay, really interesting. And now, so that's what's going on with Hamlet. And after Hamlet, you put yourself in Shakespeare's position. And you ask this wonderful, down-to-earth, wonderfully down-to-earth question, how do you follow up a play like that? And I think the answer that you come up with is, uh, well, you write the problem plays. So... Why? How do the problem plays set Shakespeare up to then write yeah. Othello and Macbeth well, I mean, and King Lear? Not just the problem plays. I mean, we can look at Twelfth Night, you can look at the sonnets, you can look at the Phoenix and the Turtle, mm. which is it's really bizarre, um, very, very difficult narrative poem. Um, I think, you know, he, as I say, I mean, he tries to work out what he's done. Um, what, what is in this Hamlet, thing? In Hamlet, you mean, what yeah. did I do in um, Hamlet? Yeah, I mean, how does this, how can I, you know, what did I do? How can I replicate it? How can I move on from it? Um, those sorts of things. I mean, the, the, the curious thing about Hamlet is that the, the play it adapts, which we sometimes call the Ur Hamlet, which we think was on the stage about 1590, and it was, by all accounts, it was a real slasher of a revenge play which apparently was notorious, I mean, because we have several references to it um, in the record. And Shakespeare takes that on in his Hamlet and says, right, I'm going to take the worst, most schlocky, most sensationalistic um, revenge play you guys know, and I'm going to turn it into a deep, deep, deep meditation on the human condition. So the problem he faces, I think, is how do you, how do you uh, write the kind of tragedy in which I'm interested how can I do that without the superstructure of a of a, a familiar plot um, that I can I can subvert? And he he you know spends some time I think trying to answer that question. And part of the reason we call the problem plays problem plays, and that's in this case all's well that ends well, measure for measure, and Troilus and Cressida, is that they don't really fit into any of the other generic categories. They're not comedies, they're not tragedies. And so he's he's thinking about, you know, how I can do characterization, how I can use speech, how I can do those sorts of things. And the play I the play I think most fully represents those challenges and those experiments and that determination to figure things out. And it's the one I talk about is Troilus and Cressida, um, which is, you know, a really kind of it's brilliant intellectually demanding, um, intellectually stimulating play, but it's it's very hard to stage and it's it's morality, if we can talk in those terms, is only just this side of nihilistic. Uh, um, and it's one of the reasons it's not performed very often, I think. But it's it's him, I think, trying to write his way into a certain kind of space that he can use. And fast forward, and again, I feel slightly more confident in the chronology here, saying fast forward to 16.4 and the time when he's writing Othello. And again, another story of love that goes, that goes tragically wrong. He has cleared a little bit of the space that will enable him to sketch characters like Iago, who, you know, ostensibly seem like ultra-competent and very charismatic um, Machiavellian fixers, but who end up the victim of their own blind spots. And characters like Othello, who, you know, is so devoted to the idea of his own honorability that he is able to be manipulated in different ways. And again, these are not just conventional bad guys and dupes of the kind that you might find um, in, a, in a dark comedy. Um, they're characters in whom um, we have a sort of emotional, pathetic, in the sense of pathos, feeling, investment. And I think that's it took him a, took him quite a lot of time and thought and, and determination to get to that kind of spot after writing Hamlet, which we think he's finished in probably about 1600, begins it in 1599, finishes it by the middle of 1600, give or take. Well, you've given me, you've given us all so much to think about with Othello and 
And I could ask you, I could spend the rest of our time on Othello, but we do have to leave time for Lear. I mean, come on. So how, or rather, I guess, where do you see Shakespeare taking his experimentation with the tragic form to the next level in this late tragedy? Yeah, there's a a, a sort of, again, another having cake and eating it move I, I play several times in the book is to borrow, having said that Aristotle's not that important to Shakespeare, I borrow from Aristotle's poetics the sort of the three essential parts of tragedy, one of which is plot, one of which is deep characterization, and the other of which is a sort of highfalutin philosophical language we've talked about. And what I think makes Lear distinctive is the degree to which he well, he not only pushes each of those individually to their absolute limits, um, or heights, I suppose, rather than limits, the tragic whole is an expression of the sort of deep interpenetration of those three different ways of doing things, um, which is to say the way in which characters speak to themselves and to one another is one of the engines of the plot which then drives further speech and characterization in, in a sort of... it's it's. Aesthetically speaking, it's a it's a virtuous circle, but you know, thematically, in terms of the, the the action that is being represented in the plot, it is anything but virtuous. And it shows a whole range of characters, even bad guys, so to speak, charismatic bad guys like Edmund. It shows them all appealing to different versions of nature or of natural order as the ultimate arbiter and the ultimate sort of guarantor of their own virtue, of their own their own capacity to do things for the, the right reasons. And then it shows with really kind of appalled sympathy how none of them actually have access to an understanding of nature in general or human nature in particular. And all of them are acting in some sense or other in in ignorance, deliberate or inadvertent ignorance of, you know, who and what they are, how they could pursue happiness. And it is, as a result of that, I mean, I think it is, you know, in a way that Hamlet isn't, at least to my experience of reading it and watching it performed, it is utterly gut-wrenching um, because it takes away from us any form of the, the sort of consolations at which we might, might usually grasp. Even right, it takes the ground out from under your feet really completely i think the over sentence and over that again. yeah i think the sentence that really coalesced what you're talking about for me was uh, you write that in lear shakespeare emphasizes that nature as understood by the human mind is a kind of artifice it's human artifice it's again that this fiction that we make up for ourselves that alienates us yeah 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 from ourselves and from nature Exactly so. And it's and it's, you know, in a sense, if we if we track back through the through the tragedies before Lear, you know, you can see people ap appealing to ideological identity, Brutus, national identity in the case of well, I suppose Hamlet itself, with Norwegians and Danes, or in Taurus and Cressida with Trojans and Greeks gender and sexual identity in various different places. In Othello, obviously, racial identity is, is, is on the table, um, and all of which are exposed as, as fictions that, because they deny their fictionality, are dangerous and cancerous to, to the body politic, as it were. In Lear, I think he goes the whole hog. <laughs> it's, it, is, it is the world that we, we, cannot, we cannot get our heads around. Well, in the end, then, how does Shakespeare, Shakespeare's form of tragedy work on the audience, on us, differently than classical dramas? Yeah, that's a, that's a really nice question. I mean, it's, it's, it's a hard one to answer because we don't know how classical audiences. Um, we, can, we can infer certain things, but, you know, it's usually from um, sort of literary criticism with an agenda such as such as that of Aristotle. Um, what I think I can say for myself is that it's the sort of the 
open-endedness, if you like, of Shakespearean tragedy. I mean, classical tragedy, whether by Aeschylus or Sophocles or Euripides in some modes, or like Seneca, likes to tie all the loose ends together to give us some kind of resolution such that, you know, after we've experienced catharsis, we are able to have a sense that order is being restored. Which is the last thing you feel at the end of Lear. I mean, nothing is restored. Utterly, utterly. Shakespeare loves, loves advertising the fact that the conclusions to his tragedies, the degree of resolution, the degree of order we get is purely aesthetic or cosmetic or superficial. It's purely on the order of the plot. Um, You know, we have Edgar and Albany walking off into the sunset saying that, you know, well, you know, this has all been very sad, but people would be punished appropriately. We will get things back on the straight and narrow and all is well. And, you know, it's a bit like Polonius inheriting the earth. You mm. know, it's just this glib, um, unpersuasive um, um, thing. Some similar version in Hamlet and Macbeth, where in, in Hamlet, Fortinbras um, and his curiously proximate Norwegian army come along, come in and take over and say some fine words about Hamlet. All you get at the end of Macbeth, where Malcolm the Macduff returns, and, you know, all kinds of highfalutin rhetoric about redeeming the time and so on and so forth. Um, I think we're supposed to feel those things as cosmetic, not because Shakespeare's sort of given up, but because he wants to think about, about all kinds of conventional tragic closure as being, if not a cheat, then a little bit too convenient because tragedy, at least as I see him um, experimenting with it, is about grappling with that stuff that's beyond our capacity fully to understand. And by tying a bow on it at the end, we are you know, giving the audience too much of a pass. So I think, you know, um, what he does with those kind of fake ordered endings, say at the end of Lear, is to prevent us saying the kinds of things that Edgar and Albany say to moralize away the, the, the you know, the awfulness, I mean, the true awfulness of the, of the preceding 200 lines. Thank you so much. That was so clear and so interesting. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you in the book. Barbara, thank you so very much. It's been terrific talking to you. Rodri Lewis. His new book, Shakespeare's Tragic Art, is out now from Princeton University Press. This episode was produced by Matt Frassica. Garland Scott is the associate producer. It was edited by Gail Kern Pastor. We had technical assistance from Voice Tracks West in Studio City, California. Our web producer is Paola Garcia Acuna. Leonor Fernandez edits our transcripts. Final mixing services provided by Clean Cuts at 3Cs Inc. If you're a fan of Shakespeare Unlimited, we'd love you even more if you could leave us a review on your podcast platform of choice to help others find the show. Shakespeare Unlimited comes to you from the Folger Shakespeare Library. Home to the world's largest Shakespeare collection, the Folger is dedicated to advancing knowledge and the arts. The Folger's campus on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. has been recently renovated, and it's open to the public more than ever before. Come check out our brand new gardens and exhibition halls. And if our discussion of Romeo and Juliet made you want to see the play, you can still check out Raymond O'Caldwell's production at the Folger Theater. It runs through November 10th. Tickets and more information at our website, folger.edu. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>